Today on Lightning Bugs. I was four months into my internet hiatus when the pandemic hit. And I thought about, at a certain point, quitting because so much of what I had wanted from the experience was to restore those human interactions. And mm. in the first four months, I had so many of them, like insane. Con I talked to this one cab driver, this is not in the essay, the week that everything shut down. So anytime I would travel, I would get the number for a cab company from the hotel that I was staying at. And then I would just, you know, call a cab. And I was in Portland, Oregon for what was supposed to be a one week trip in March mm -hmm. of 2020, going to sound check for this concert with Caroline Shaw that ended up not happening. And the guy who took me there, this is what I remember about him, grew up on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, like, you know, working class Italian, had been a male ballerina in the Connecticut Ballet, oh. had been had worked as a translator for the CIA in Germany, in Berlin in the 80s before the wall came down. And of course, like you can have those conversations with a, a rideshare driver, but there's something about the fact that the transaction occurs through an app that, that sort of sets us in terms of friction or lack thereof on a course to not have those conversations. Hi, if you're enjoying listening to Lightning Bugs, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps a lot. Hello, listeners and YouTube viewers. We're back with another episode of Lightning Bugs, which to me means it's Thursday. Uh, but in an era where facts are up for interpretation, you can think it's any day you want to. Just as long as you think it's that day, that's the day that it is. But for me, it's Thursday. And if you think it's otherwise, I will fight you on Twitter. Today's guest is singer-songwriter, pianist, and orchestral composer, Gabriel Kahane. He's released several albums to critical acclaim, and he's written essays for publications such as The New Yorker and The New York Times. Gabriel has a unique approach to songwriting, to say the least. In 2016, he traveled all around the United States gathering inspiration for his album, Book of Travelers. Recently, he took a year off, completely off the grid. No phone, no nothing. He wrote an essay about that experience for The New York Times that will be published soon. Keep an eye out for that. It's really great. I enjoyed our chat, and I hope you do too. <laughs> Without further ado, Mr. Gabe Kahane. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, it's so funny because I think you and I have actually only had one conversation ever. Two. 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 Oh, but who's counting? Uh, but who's counting? Um, but then I also feel like we know each other really well somehow yeah <laughs> that, that's that's the nature of like uh you know music peers isn't it we see the same yes. shitty backstages with all the dicks on the wall same airports yes. and have the same sort of and you and i because uh of our involvements with other kinds of music and that makes that gives us a lot in common, so it might feel like we know each other when we don't. <laughs> well, and, and also I have the benefit of having known your music since I was 14 years old. And you're all grows and... up now. <laughs> Vaguely. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, well, and we also have in common the shame of being piano players in a world that sometimes look at, looks askance yeah. at, uh, at the piano. Yeah. So we can start a support group for that, right? Like... Call it recover middle class living room furniture. <laughs> totally. Or as my dad once said, uh, when he had to play a not so great piano, a, a PSO, a piano shaped object. <laughs> <laughs> the iron ironing board. Yes. Yeah. This is your manager told me that the theme of this conversation is MySpace nostalgia. Is that still the the agenda? We're just talking about MySpace All things for, Tom. for two yeah. hours. Yeah, it's just about Tom. <laughs> oh, I'm. I don't. You feel like Tom's profile pic is indelibly printed on your brain in the white T-shirt with the sort of shit-eating grin. I'm blown away that by the things that I now find sentimental, uh, because you know, like kids have vintage video games that just came out. V video just came out. <laughs> yeah. It's weird. I, it's funny that you you mentioned that about sentimentality because what I'm I'm sort of finishing up a record right now, but then I'm also writing a choral piece 
about my time as a choral singer in high school and kind of <laughs> interrogating my nostalgia for what was like ultimately a very sheltered, um, you know, upbringing without, e even though I have lovely progressive parents, but somehow living where I lived, um, I was oblivious as much to class and class mm. consciousness as I was to racism and the intersection of the two. But on the other hand, there was this beautiful thing where every morning I got up at set, you know, six 30 to go sing like Renaissance counterpoint with a bunch of Mormons and Protestants and Baptists. And I was like the Jewish kid. And we all communed over this beautiful music at seven in the morning. And, you know, occasionally there were tensions that flared up, um, having to do with, you know, differences in politics and, and culture outside of singing. But I've been thinking a lot about that question of nostalgia and sentiment. I made an album of, um, just, I was the recording engineer, essentially just recording, uh, university acapella groups singing my songs because I always wanted to have my music covered and it really wasn't. I bet Medler covered one of my songs early in my career, and that was it. And I always thought I would be a songwriter. So as soon as I found found out these kids were singing my songs, I was I was in a van with microphones, and I wanted to pick this up because I felt that was flattered my music. And also, they were doing it better than I was. But but where my heart went every single time when I was recording this was the actual experience of singing in a group, and that you're writing about your experience. It's it seems to me that like most of your immediate audience is actually just the just the choir. Well, I'm really glad that we're finally getting to chat because I feel like we've been talking about talking for years now. It's true. It's true. And last time we were talking, well, we were, uh, I was in an airport. Mm -hmm. And um, all I really remember is, is uh, we were talking about arranging non quote classical music mm. pops mm -hmm. for an orchestra and um some sort of award show kind of uh gestures to avoid um and 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 both agreeing that uh, cuz i hadn't found anyone who seemed to really uh be as passionate about this as as i've become which is drums bass guitars i'm not saying they're against the law I'm just saying you have to look at what the orchestra does and why you would want to bring in those those things and what that does, even the, the demoralizing of the orchestra who is perfectly capable of doing the things that you've brought a six-string bass player in to do and with their plexiglass and everything. So I, I remember talking about that last and uh, feeling that, okay, there are three people now. Is I feel like there's me and you. Well, there's Rob Moose. Who he'll go yeah. he'll go a little bit bass guitar on you because yeah, he yeah, doesn't yeah. mind that a little bit but I I can't I can't do it. Well, thank you for for reminding me of that because yeah I do think that that you and I share an interest when we're arranging pop songs for an orchestra, um, like let the orchestra be the orchestra and don't yeah. cover it up with a rhythm section and it 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 both makes the job of arranging a lot more fun. Yeah, it makes the orchestra's job more fun. And it also kind of, you know, it foregrounds the singer and the song in a different way. And, and then I also think you have an opportunity to think about, say, a string section as the rhythm section, which is right. something I really love, yes. where you're kind of empowering them to be their own rhythmic babysitters rather than relying on the drum kit that's like 9,000 feet away. Right, <laughs> you know, behind no, that's huge. Glass. Yeah, no, that's huge. I mean, if you if you listen to something that grooves like Shostakovich, you're not going to find them trying to uh, create a, a clave between someone back in the rhythms uh, uh, in the in the percussion section and I don't know the the uh, pits and double bass or something like you might think in Sibelius that's going to work, but you see proximity in the orchestra. But these things, the orchestra, the uh, orchestra musicians know when someone's trying to when they're when basically what they do is not being respected and i think mm -hmm. that that too many pop musicians go in and there are about 80 ways that you've shown your disrespect mm -hmm. to their entire life yeah uh, and it took me you know it took me 10 years of 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 touring with orchestras to really begin to get it i hate to say it but it took me a long time i think that that question of respect is something i i've thought about a lot um from a kind of psychological standpoint, 
where the first impression that an orchestral musician has of you occurs before you meet them. It happens yep. when they see the part that you send them. Yep. And if the part is beautifully engraved and really clear right. and, and doesn't have mistakes, then you're starting, at least you're not starting with a deficit. At least you're That's not right. starting with, oh God, Ben folds again. Yep. Whereas if you send them a part that is full of collisions of different objects on the staff and the music is all crammed together, yep. they're like, fuck this guy. I don't, I'm not, you know, I don't want to. Totally. And, and I found- It's a found, bad day for them. I, I find as a kind of interloper, because, you know, I, I think maybe a little more than you, I interlope into this space of writing like concert music, yeah, with, you know, a capital right. C. And and I feel like I'm coming in with the deficit of being the folk songwriter or whatever. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that I demonstrate respect for my colleagues is by sending them beautiful looking yeah. music. It might not sound beautiful, but at least it's no, it, look it good. does, <laughs> and it also looks beautiful because I've seen I've seen your music at the at the Kennedy Center, and I was just like, oh man, how, how does he do in this? Why does it look like? Why does my stuff look like I just went like I did this for band class? <laughs> Yours well, looks like Beethoven. You know, I um. So I had an assistant for a few years. He was a student of mine. Um, his name's Frankie Rousseau. And he had worked at Nunsuch for a couple of years. He was Bob Hurwitz's, hmm. the legendary Bob Hurwitz's oh, assistant. Bob, yes. Yeah, we all we all know. I mean, Love I was Bob. texting with Bob yesterday. Um, but um, but Frankie came to me as a student, really gifted big band composer, and I started giving him copy work, and I was really ruthless because I had learned from colleagues, Rob among them, Rob Moose, the aforementioned amazing arranger, violinist, Why Music, your your colleague. Um, when I was just starting out, he was like, dude, your music looks terrible. Like, get get it together. <laughs> um, he was like, "This it awesome. sounds great, but it looks awful. And so with Frankie, yeah. um, when I, sometimes I still do my own parts, but, but I, I, trained Frankie kind of mercilessly to have a, you know, checklist of like 20 things you mm -hmm. look for on every page. And, um, he just did this, uh, piano concerto, the copy work for, um, piece that I wrote for my dad that premieres in Kansas city next month. And, Congratulations. and oh, thank you. But, but I he, love the Kaufman center too, oh, by the way. It's such That's a just, beautiful hall. Yeah. Yeah. But he did a gorgeous, gorgeous job. And, and I like to go back sometimes and just do a full set of parts, mm. even though it makes me totally bonkers and i start to seem like a oh, yeah. psychotic person mm -hmm. um which you are yeah do you do your own parts ever or do you do you shop that out to to people um no i shop that out. i mean i get it very very close yeah. i just you know like i start to get i i i, I can't just 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 small things that i just don't want to right uh um to to, to deal yeah. with um, well i appreciate uh, like like where you're splitting the the where I'm splitting the stage yeah. and how much information is like, like I, I don't think I haven't played an orchestra since I was in college, and I, I, I don't understand what they need to see as yeah. much as I should. Yeah, it's interesting. So my mom is a psychologist, and I realized a few years ago when I was working on this record about a train trip through America after the 2016 election, I realized, you know, growing up people always said, you know, what's it like having a musician for a father? That must be such a big influence because mm. my father is a, a concert pianist and conductor. Yeah. And, and and he actually grew up playing in folk rock bands. He and my mom played in, in folk rock bands in LA together. And then he oh, took this turn oh, and cool. became a concert pianist. Um, but I realized how much my mom as a psychologist influenced me, not just in how I think about writing lyrics and thinking about characters, but also that relationship to an orchestra and what they see on the page. Mm -hmm. And I've never played in an orchestra, but I read music well enough to know what they're not going to want to look at. And right, it's just like, exactly. so going through each line and putting yourself in the, in the mind of, of right. a musician and like, are, are they going to feel okay looking at this on the page? Well, at the your end of the day, your producers had better cut this part because this is like the most boring thing. Oh no, but this is what I enjoy because you know you're trying to. And I think it's of interest to an artist to go, okay, I have an idea, I have a, I have something in my head, and and it involves an orchestra. So at this point, I I need to I need to uh, manipulate, sway, uh, uh, convince a large group of players to do what's in my head and. You don't just boss someone around. You ha you you know you it's it, it, there there are manners 
if you're going to tell someone you're, I've got your time for two hours and, um, and, and we're going to rehearse. I think it's really, really important what it looks like and the impression that you make when you come in, because you're asking for the cooperation and you're asking to sway and convince uh, a group of people. So if that means, look, you know, some musicians might think it's ridiculous that you need to put some Italian in there. Others would say, you know, just, just write, I need a little milkshake sound here or make it sound like the Beatles. I mean, whatever you do, it has to be human. Mm -hmm. This is not a theory. You're going to be sitting with people in the same airspace as them making music together. So you really need to have some fucking manners yeah. is the way I see yeah. it. A hundred percent. I I actually, um, on that note of, you know, writing little things to the players, there's a story that I love, which is, I think, I think it was, it was either the Alabama symphony or the North Carolina symphony where oh, it was the North Carolina symphony where I, I went to play, um, this piece that I wrote about the WPA travel guides that were written in the 1930s, where I took all these travel guide stuff and set it to music. And it was kind of a tour of the country called Gabriel's guide to the 48 States. And there was this one movement that has this kind of Ivesian thing where there's this low D flat pedal in the bass, And then the harmonies are kind of shifting and slippery above. And then I'm singing over it. And I always, always as an arranger or orchestrator, I'm trying to avoid someone, you know, pedaling a football for nine years. Yeah. And this was a situation where I just like could not get around it. Bass right. players just had to fucking play D flat for 16 bars. Yep. And so I wrote under each measure, I was like, I am so sorry that <laughs> you have to play this D flat. And on a break, from the rehearsal, this big, burly Russian guy who I later found out is like one of the very dour dudes in the orchestra. He comes up to me. He's like, Gabriel, it's it's very funny what you write in the part in this moment. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I won. <laughs> no, you did. And they won too because you guys got to play music together without – you just took the bullshit out of the way. And you yeah. were just being people. <laughs> hey, Ben. This is Vinny from Queens, New York. Your good friend Sarah Bareilles created a very successful Broadway musical several years ago, and I know that you have been telling stories through music for many years, and you even recorded an incredible orchestral album, So There, many years ago. So my question is, when are you going to create your own musical? Come on, man, the world wants this. Let's do it, please. <laughs> I'm already waiting in line for tickets. Love you, Ben. Thank you. Oh man, I don't know. Uh, one day, um, there, there's a, there's a thing. I, see, I've started to to do a, a musical um, a lot of different times. Uh, the first time I I started to think about it and uh, was uh, in in the nineties. And uh, actually, Pete Townsend, uh, I, I met Pete Townsend at a, 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 a taping of a TV show, and he came over and said you have to write a musical and you have to do it while you're still young, not when you're old like me. And I'm probably as old as he was when he told me that. And I still haven't done it. So I didn't take uncle Pete's advice. Um, I don't know why I haven't. I really can't say except that the music business is, is super busy and maybe I'm not quite as wise as Sarah is about how I, um, you know, how I divide my time. Um, but at any rate, I, I think I will one uh, one day, um, and and I, I might I might do it in the next couple of years. <laughs> you know, you you have ideas. I have ideas on what I would like to write about, right? And uh, then something else will come up, and I'll think, well, maybe that's a better idea. And then someone else will come and say, uh, we would like you to uh, jo you know join forces and do this thing, and and it it it's it all, it's all it's all a lot i think when sarah decided to do hers and i i spoke to her right as she was making this decision i don't think she she agonized over it the way that i have which is uh probably again because she's smarter than i am uh she just thought well here's an opportunity it looks like a good thing uh i like the people and i might do it and she just actually just did it where i've thought about it too much um but the, the long answer is is um yeah um yeah, I will. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I've just gone through this experience of um, self-producing my sort of both pandemic record slash the record that I made after taking a year off the internet. 
I wrote yeah. 30 songs in October of last year, which was the the 12th month of taking a year off. That's right. Your song a day. That's and, right. And, um, and I ended up making this record that involved musicians in Finland, London, Nashville, San Francisco, LA, Chicago, New York. But at the end of the day, I was doing all the editing and comp, mm. you know, comping my own vocals was just like, I would rather have a root canal yeah. than have to comp my own vocals. And very often, it's interesting. Sometimes, you know, I, I don't know if you have this experience, but like I would approach, I would sing eight, 10 takes of a song one night and I would start putting together a comp. And then I would realize that, that something about it, I had just like misunderstood what mm-hmm. the song wanted to be and then go in the next night. And then it would be like the first or second take. It's like, okay, this is now, right. now I'm starting to find what this is. You used it as, as pre-production or as a, as a way to learn how to sing. You have to learn how to sing every new song you were doing. Totally, totally. And but I think the thing that remains really elusive for me is, and I'm sure for most singers, is to not not let uh or man, I should I should qualify that and say singers who know too much, mm-hmm. um not let, you know, pitch be the guiding light and figuring out how you can hear your own voice as just an expressive tool Mm -hmm. and know when you're when you're delivering the goods whether it's in tune or out of tune Mm -hmm. and i've also i've had this this conversation with it with um a couple other folks who i feel like are are in my aesthetic world of being really envious of those singers where there's something about the timbre and the color of their voice that makes me just like not give a fuck if they're singing out of tune. Right. Like someone like a Dylan. It's like, yeah, he's who such, was actually pretty, pretty in tune on those first live records. Right. But by but my then, standards, then, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I but, saw but your I shoulders like, raised beyond well, your headphones. No, but, but. I, but I guess like, I guess I, I find that, that he's such a profound communicator. Right. And the older I get, it's like all I care about is are right. you communicating or not? <laughs> Here's and, something to think about, though. I hear what you're saying. You can't think your way into having soul, for instance, like mm-hmm. like the things like. And and one of the things I wanted to talk to you about because I think um, you and I and a handful of people that I uh, I I know of or can imagine um, do engage our 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 brains in a way that we might feel like is not always healthy. You know, like I do envy people with such a compelling one-celled organism way of thinking about expressing themselves. That's who we love. We mm-hmm. don't, you know, and 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 it is difficult when you engage your brain. So I would just kind of say this, which is maybe we do need to just worry about it being in tune. Because if that's all you're worried about, then as a byproduct of just the fact that you're doing it, the expression that you can't control, you can't intellect intellectually lift that weight. Like I had a producer who, uh, in, uh, our first producers in, in my band, he was just a, a rock and roll sound guy at the local club. He was very much into just, let's just get the notes right. The rest of it will happen. Mm-hmm. Just get it in tune. If you'll sing in tune, you know, it's all. And that actually was really good for me because I would have otherwise gone down some other wormholes. And I feel like Bob Dylan, now we don't know, he would never tell you. But I have a feeling probably in that era, he and John Hammond or whoever else was in the room were probably just thinking about, is he in tune? Maybe it's, not. It's but very it's possible, possible. And, and I think it's you know I think it's different for everyone, and I also don't think it's a binary. I I think right um, totally. I mean I I particularly struggle with singing because it's it's the I have a kind of like pretty voice, you know, but in a very mm. kind of conventional sense, and I don't think um, you know there's some singers I admire where it's like they open their mouth and it, and they could be singing the phone book and it's just deeply expressive. Yeah. And I think you're right that sometimes if you chase that too hard it ends mm-hmm. up feeling oversung, over overthought or um, as my my friend who I think you know Tony Berg likes to say you were you were producing the vocal while you were singing it. <laughs> I like all my guests to improvise a a lesson 
an exercise that is achievable for a week. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be wake up and read poetry for five minutes, or it could be complex, whatever you want it to be, that will that will likely help us think about our creative endeavors in a different light. If your job permits it, keep your devices off until two, three, four in the afternoon and just mm. see what, what life feels like living with no, no digital interference until a certain point in the day. That's something that I find really, really helpful when I can stick to it. I realize that some people have day jobs that prevent them from, from doing that or are students and need to be uh, uh, available on, on or their email nanny frequently. surveillance cam to make sure. Right, right, right. <laughs> but, but I do think, I mean, for me, the single biggest predictor of what kind of day I'm going to have is if I can stick to that, if I right. turn everything off before I go to sleep and then work till three or four in the afternoon and then get into the administrative nonsense of mm -hmm. writing to agents and managers and, and, and that kind of stuff. That's hugely, hugely transformative. Okay, so um, the exercise is, to the extent that it's possible, uh, even if it's two days a week, I mean, we want it to be achievable. So if someone thinks they can take two days a week and not turn on their phone till uh, the afternoon and then reflect on it. I used to think it was, oh, just don't check your email or social media mm. until such and such o'clock. But it turns out that our brain will use anything on the internet that that gives us a dopamine hit could be looking at npr right. or pitchfork or, or whatever so i think it really has to be no internet until x o'clock mm -hmm. and and maybe it's about getting up you know if you do have a job that or are a student and it requires you to be you know constantly monitoring email it's about just getting up an hour earlier and spending one hour with everything off and that's your time to like write longhand or sit mm -hmm. and sit with your instrument but just to to create a space the longer it is the more fruitful it is i think mm -hmm. um so i think it is no matter what your situation is it's going to be achievable in some way it's just a question of degree okay so you wrote an essay it's in its early form and i uh, and I was lucky enough to be able to kind of see inside it and read it, uh, all 22 pages of it. And I think it's beautiful. I really, I you know, I, I took the Zephyr across the country one time. Uh, I don't know which one you, which one of those trains you took, but just your descriptions of the train uh, and, you know, like the various, everyone from con artists to fucking, I don't know, Mennonites to to someone who's who's uh, trying to reconnect with their estranged daughter. All these people that you're on the train with, they you have to be, you have to be on the train with them, and you have to eat dinner with them because yeah, that's yeah, who you've yeah. been sat down with. I loved that. Oh, thanks. Uh, I love the way you described it, and I guess I thought when I read it, let's just see if you can boil down. Mm -hmm. As an artist, what you learned from sort of the experiment of internet fasting and how you would, um, what you would try to pass to a class of younger yeah. yous, you know, a, a, yeah. a, 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 about that. Can they avoid pitfalls? Mm -hmm. Did you learn anything yeah. specifically to your artistry? Uh, um, yeah. Yeah. Totally. So, so I think in order to talk about the year that I took off the internet, I have to back up and talk about the train trip that I took in 2016. Yeah. So the morning after the 2016 election, I got on a train at Penn Station and I rode a little under 9,000 miles around the country. And it was not a spontaneous decision. I, I bought my train tickets about two weeks before. And I said, you know, regardless of the outcome, I need to go figure out what the fuck is actually happening in this country right now? Because I had the sense that um, my my vision was being occluded by living in Brooklyn. Yeah, the my social surroundings physically, but also the internet uh, landscape that I was surrounded by was really cloistered. Um, so I took this trip, and on a whim, I decided to leave my phone at home. I brought my laptop, but didn't connected to the internet at any point. So I, I spent 13 days totally off the grid, 
talking to strangers. And it was a really transformative experience for me. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I learned a lot about my own prejudices, about the way that we conceive of tolerance. I think that what I perceived in myself then, which was that, for example, you know, I sought out all the people of color on the train. And when it came to, you know, Midwestern guy with a trucker hat and a Carhartt vest, I had, to, even though those were precisely the people I wanted to talk to. And even as I'm saying this, it sounds like condescending and obnoxious, but I had to kind of like will myself into those conversations. Mm-hmm. And so I think that then as now, I was aware that there's a certain kind of, you know, cosmopolitan culture for for whom it's totally acceptable to have contempt for you know working white people or or people who are of a non-cosmopolitan non-coastal culture Mm -hmm. and that that i sort of knew that about myself but seeing it in action made me feel really shitty about myself and and as the trip progressed um I, the thing that was really moving to me was discovering that the thing that we all had in common was that we're all, most of us, incredibly devoted to our families and will walk to the end of the earth for our families. And there were a lot of people where, yeah, our politics didn't line up. Um, One thing that I feel like I've learned later, a friend of mine, a, a playwright, Brandon Jacobs Jenkins, introduced me to this phrase, privilege of knowledge. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we talk a lot about white privilege, uh, but we don't talk as much about privilege of knowledge. Yeah. And I think that actually works in the other way where it's very easy for someone like me or you who has the benefit of um, a certain kind of worldliness and education to look at someone and say, project onto them everything that we know. And then based on that, say, you're racist, you're complicit in white supremacy, but they don't have all the information necessarily that we have. And so I think that going back to this idea of empathy and generosity of spirit, it's not to, you know, let people off the hook for being shitty or complicit in white supremacy, but to recognize that not everyone has the same media diet that we have. They don't have the same access to, um, you know, cognitive ability that, that we have. We, you know, we know not to listen to Tucker Carlson, for example. Um, and, and so, you know, that, that was sort of this idea of privilege of knowledge that came a little bit later, but anyway, to, to kind of sum up, you know, this, the train trip was really transformative. I sang with, with these, um, these Luddite Mennonites who, who had Lutheran hymnals and we, we sang two nights together and it was a really like super, super moving experience. Um, I, I, I also, love the part in the essay where there's some doubt as to whether you're going to talk to them anymore or not once they've discovered that you were Jewish. Yes. Yeah. That was the, the first night of our singing ended with, um, I had asked them about their faith and they said, well, we're, we're old order German Baptist brethren. And I said, what, you know, I'm not familiar with that. Um, and how, you know, how far back does the church go all the way back to Christ, we believe. And this went on and on. And then a few hymns later, one of them says, he says, do you mind if I ask what your faith is? And I say, I'm Jewish. And then they just fall completely silent. And, <laughs> Crickets. But, but, then, but then the next night I was sitting in my, in my sleeper car and this Amtrak employee knocks on the door and he says, excuse me, are you Gabriel? And I say, yeah. And he says, there are six young men in the observation car. They're about to sing and they wanted to know if you would join them. And I you know, got all choked up and went back and sang with them. And it was, and of course there's this irony in that these are guys who don't use the internet. They don't use electricity yeah. basically at all, except for their tractors. Um, and, uh, and there I was this, you know, dude from Brooklyn who had decided for 13 days to give up technology. So we, we were sort of connected that way. Anyway, fast forward to three years later, I realized that what I needed to do to really get deeper into this question of efficiency and convenience and debt was to take a year off the internet because what what is more a symbol of that formulation than than the smartphone? Yeah. Um, and of course, I was also a total unreformed addict. I mean, I was terrible. I was on my. I phone was going to ask you if you actually considered yourself like legitimately a, 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 an addict. 
Oh yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's, Mm. I think I describe in the essay, like I would spend hours staging an Instagram photo. I would lose like an entire morning that I could have been writing music to like, and it was so much about, you know, compensating for my insecurity as a kind of like niche artist who had had, you know, certain kinds of success, but not other kinds. And I would look at my friends' Instagrams and they're like playing at the BBC proms. And I'm like, and I'm just here playing a show for 70 people in Asheville. Mm. (laughs) Um, and, uh, so there, it's really hard, obviously, to compress a year into a, a brief statement. I'm, I'm already monologuing. But one of the other, I think, really crucial um, moments for me about that year off the internet was being reminded of all the interactions that we don't have anymore because mm-hmm. of our devices. But that I think and, is profound. Yeah. And, and, and thinking about how... Um, I can't help but think that part of the reason that around the world we are as polarized as we are, like it doesn't matter what kind of government you have, what Mm. kind of system of taxation, that part of this polarization is a function of the fact that we have fewer and fewer opportunities to engage each other in really simple interactions like getting directions, ordering coffee, whatever Mm. it is. And um, that was actually... You know, I was four months into my internet hiatus when the pandemic hit. And I thought about at a certain point quitting because so much of what I had wanted from the experience was to restore those human interactions. Mm. And in the first four months, I had so many of them, like insane. Con- I talked to this one cab driver. This is not in the essay. The week that everything shut down. Um, so anytime I would travel, I would get the number for a cab company from the hotel that I was staying at. And then I would just, you know, call a cab. And I was in Portland, Oregon for what was supposed to be a one week trip in March mm-hmm. of 2020, going to sound check for this concert with Caroline Shaw that ended up not happening. And the guy who took me there, this is what I remember about him, grew up on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, like, you know, working class Italian, had been a male ballerina in the Connecticut ballet oh. had been had worked as a translator for the CIA in Germany in Berlin in the 80s before the wall came down and lived in Neukölln. This guy just made shit up probably. <laughs> he he very well might have. Then he was like, but now I'm a welder and a metal artist and I'm the comptroller for a brewery. Huh. And dude was just like so wild and and of course like you can have those conversations with a a rideshare driver but there's something about the fact that the transaction occurs through an app Mm -hmm. that that sort of sets us in terms of friction or lack thereof on a course to not have those conversations that's right i think that's true yeah yeah. Um, yeah 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 you can i mean if if nothing else if you want to stop off at at uh at store and pick up a bag of cigarettes they're like um, could you just go into the app for that? And you're like, okay, uh, if I can uh, add to and stuff like that. And, and then you hear it pop up on his phone and he's like, yeah, it's cool. And he takes you there. I mean, and totally. no one can help it. That's just the, that's just our system. Right, uh, right. I think that's probably exactly right. Did you ever read a really short book, uh, uh, Kurt Vonnegut's last book, A Man Without a Country? Mm-mm. Oh, it's great. It's so great. I'll have great. to check it out. He says, uh, and I thought about this when I read your essay, uh, which again I want to I want to make sure. That, uh, hopefully, this stays in the in the edit. Uh, when this essay comes out, I really want people to read it. I think it's 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 already great, and mm. you're going to make it uh, uh, greater, as you say. Uh, but because there's no way I could get that, we're, this conversation doesn't substitute for that. I guess is mm, what I'm saying. Mm. So we didn't. We, that's not what we're doing. But when uh, when I read the essay, I thought about Kurt Vonnegut and what he said in this book that he wrote right before he died. He said, "Life is about farting around, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise." Mm. And he and he's like, "My wife is efficient. You know, she knows how to use these things." And she's like, "Why don't you get a? Why don't you just print that out?" And he's like, "Because I like to walk down the street." Go to the print shop. I have a Mm. crush on the little girl that makes the copies. I like to Mm. talk to her. I stand in line, talk to people. And then I walk Mm. down the other way because I like to go by the bagel shop. And Mm -hmm. he has the things he wants to do in real life. And to him, it didn't make any sense to 
to be efficient by by nature in that way. And just that he said life is about farting around and don't let anyone else tell you mm. otherwise is uh, his sort of Kurt Vonnegut way of saying that some things just need to be experienced. Yeah. Well, what's so interesting is like there's the part of me, the like wanting to be self-aware part of me that wants to serve as a check against this kind of like reactionary, the internet is terrible. Mm-hmm. I don't get that because out of your essay. It, beca- because there's, there, well, I'm glad you don't get that. Yeah. I mean, there, I feel like in every era, there are always people who are sort of sounding the alarm against progress and mm-hmm. take these kinds of reactionary positions. What feels different about our moment is that there is so much hard evidence that a lot of our technologies are fucking destroying the world. Yeah. And so it's like, how do you find that? How do you strike that balance between like on the one hand, it's incredible that you and I are able to talk to each other the the way that we are. And I can yeah. see your cool ass synths in the back and the is that I wish a Fender, they were P, mine. Fender P bass back there. It's my friend, John. Um, I wish it all was mine, except I wouldn't want to have to wire it up. But, yeah. um, but, um, but like, that's amazing. And, yeah, and the fact that I was able to make this record and record with, you know, my friend who lives in, in the North of Finland and my friend, yeah. Paul, who plays bass and lives in Nashville, like that stuff is all amazing. And, and knowing how to pick and choose and to distinguish between the, the things that are salutary and the things that are really, you know, like the, the havoc that, that Facebook has, has wrought on the fabric of our country and other countries around the world. It's unspeakable. Yep. It's, it's totally fucking bonkers. Yep. No, um, it is. And, and, and I, and so I guess that's where, you know, I, I come back to the fact that so many people are writing these, these, you know, screeds against social media while mm-hmm. being on social media. And, and my, my hope for whatever form this, you know, my project ends up taking is that the little bit of authority that I have as a niche singer songwriter is that I took a year off the internet and there were consequences, but I think the benefits outweighed the consequences. And I think also this, the Lewis Hyde book, The Gift, which I can't recommend enough. And I, I, I think I, I wrote about this toward the end of the essay, but I was thinking more and more about how the way that we set things up, even physically in a concert hall, sometimes by necessity for the kind of adoration and adulation of the artist and treating the artist as an object of awe rather than as a facilitator of communal experience mm-hmm. is so toxic. Mm-hmm. And, and I think a lot of the entertainers I love the most, and I'm thinking specifically of Chris Thiele here, um, I so admire the way that, like I think in addition to all of his insane gifts as a mandolinist and as a composer and as a songwriter, he knows how to make a room full of people have a good time together. Mm-hmm. And that feels kind of like maybe his biggest concern that that on some level the culture of bluegrass, which is like is a a folk music that facilitates people coming together to have a good time, that's infused in everything he does. And that's a thing that I kind of hate about most classical music culture. Yeah, it's that that um, you know when I was in college, I took one ethnomusicology class, and it just completely exploded my brain because you learn that. In 95% of musical cultures, no matter how sophisticated the music is, it's there in service of something truly social, not yeah. about, about, you know, um, looking at artists as objects of awe. Yeah. And that, that I don't know that um, I would have gotten to that kind of thinking if I'd been plugged in. I mean, maybe I would have, but um, I think being off of those platforms allowed me to do some hard but fruitful thinking about why, you know, why I actually do what I do and wanting to make more of what I do about facilitating community. Because yeah. like, what the fuck else do we have? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, that, there's a, one of my favorite uh, uh, artists I've discovered over the last 10 years is a guy whose name I can't pronounce. And I think it's Garris, Nick Garris, but it could be Nick Garris. But he's a he's a a dancer, and mm. and he's basically a a a, a tap uh, sand scrape dancer, very kind of Irish 
he's from Detroit, but but mm. his family was Irish. And all his shows are just in houses. And sometimes he plays with fusion jazz groups. And mm. he is such a great drummer. What a mm. beautiful drummer this guy is. But he just exudes, we're here right now. This is where we are. And today a thing happened. And we're going to do this where it's very tribal, but it's also really intelligent. And uh, I love seeing stuff like that. To keep me honest, as someone who has been standing in front of larger audiences who seems to need that for, for my career. One of the reasons I brought up the, uh, the Kaufman Center is because of, of, of all of the uh, grand halls that we have in the U.S., especially the ones that are trying mm-hmm. to be European. What I really like about that one is it comes closer than most halls to being with the audience. Mm. You feel you're sort of with it. I mean, yeah, you are still got stage lights and you're still on, but it's yeah. a little more honest and you could get even more. You know, I think there's mm-hmm. one in Cologne that really feels, I think it was Cologne or Frankfurt I played uh, a few years ago and I was like, wow, I'm in the audience. This is kind of cool. Right. But you also, I mean, I haven't, I think I've only seen you play live once. It was with Y Music. Um, it was Rob and Shoko's second date before they were married and had a child. Um, but I remember being able to sense even from that, that you you are also someone who has such an incredible generosity, both toward the people who you're on stage with. And I think maybe I've seen some video clips of you with orchestra where, where what you're doing is really deeply communal and that mm. you're, whatever ego you have, you're really channeling into this very generous, place of of creating a sense of of you know one community making a thing happen and i i i really admire that well i would take that as the highest compliment that could be given i appreciate that thanks i mean i feel like that's we're just a bunch of people uh, uh, in uh, we're we're playing drums together at the end of a hard work day or there's something that we're doing that that is that is uh telling a story and and everyone doesn't have to be a musician they can be a dancer or they can even be a critic, but there is something present tense that has to happen uh, mm-hmm. in it that has to be generous and has to be mutual, um, or it just feels fucking corny to me. Um, well, man, I think that we have, to tell you the truth, you really did hit on all of my um, sticky notes. Amazing. And while we didn't center it as much around your internet experience, I also think that um, that's all, at the end of the day really not what you're talking about, uh, and it's deep. It's deep, and you're still getting there. So to tell a bunch of kids you should stay off this platform or or do this or or or, or that, uh, w- would you say it's yeah. accurate that that's not the advice you're really giving? No, no, I think I don't. I don't think so. I think I think probably the advice is to think about. There, you know, in the Shoshana Zuboff book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, which I think is an incredible kind of landmark book from 2019. Um, one of the things that she cautions people is to not treat anything in technology as inevitable and to always mm. be reminded that, um, that there is agency behind the actors who are making these technologies, that the technologies right. don't, don't exist on their own, that they're in the service of somebody else's needs, desires, greed, profit, so. what, whatever. And I think that the, the more that we can just be thoughtful about like, why, why is Instagram showing me an, you know, this ad for um, shoes two days after it showed me a post of my friend who I feel really jealous of. Oh, it's because they know that if I'm feeling badly about myself, I'm 17% more likely to buy the shoes on Thursday after you showed me, you know, so-and-so's post on Tuesday. And I think the, the yeah. more that, that we have that, that awareness or thinking about incentive structures, we can start to incorporate these, these platforms either into our lives or, or, you know, minimize the way that we, we use them as tools. Right. I like that. I think that's good. No one said that yet. That's, I dig it. Well, I'm the, I mean, it's my brand, right? <laughs> it's your brand for the moment. <laughs> I think great musician is your brand. Um, oh, I love the way you cringed when I said that's my brand. 
<laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I the, the, the word brand. Is, oh, I uh, hate that word. It's terrible. It's pretty rough. Yeah. <laughs> It's a rough word. Oh, yeah, um, it's awful. Okay, well, look, I'm never good at ending these things, but that's the end. Well, it's so so good to talk to you. And, good to talk um, to you too. And hope hope to see you soon. Hi, if you're enjoying listening to Lightning Bugs, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps a lot. Thank you, oh so much, for watching Lightning Bugs on YouTube. Check out more episodes and subscribe if you have not already. You can also listen to Lightning Bugs wherever podcasts may be found.